my pleasure to welcome President uh, Parashenko and Prime Minister Groisman uh, here today, as well as a record number of uh, investors representing companies with assets under management of over $3 trillion. We are glad to see such uh, interest, and over the next two days, we'll provide you with the information you need to make comfortable investment decisions. Uh, this will, as always, include input from key policymakers about fiscal and monetary policy, structural reforms, cooperation with IMF, and key geopolitical allies of Ukraine, the EU, and United States. We'll review performance in agriculture after last year's record harvest, energy, logistics, metallurgy, banking, oil and gas, and other sectors. But this year, we pay special attention to politics and presidential elections. We have invited pollsters from Ukraine and overseas with experience in forecasting elections uh, in Ukraine and in other countries to help us predict the most likely outcome. We have also invited the top four candidates as per recent polls. We are glad uh, to have three of them represented personally or by their team members, including the president who, according to the latest polls, has moved into second place behind uh, Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, only Mr. Zelensky could unfortunately not join us or send his representatives. We understand he's busy finishing his uh, latest movie about the life of a president <laughs> and uh, <laughs> catching up on uh, economics and other subjects needed uh, for a possible unscripted presidency. Uh, to conclude, uh, I'll share briefly uh, how we read uh, the situation at uh, Dragon Capital. We are quite optimistic uh, since uh, the middle of 2015. We have closed a couple dozen uh, private equity and real estate transactions, investing more than $500 million together with our partners. Uh, most of them, most of these investments over the last year and a half, we invested in IT, e-commerce, food processing, logistics and commercial real estate. Uh, we have never invested uh, so much money over any preceding period. Uh, over the last two years, uh, we don't see companies not only in our portfolio, but also among, among our competitors growing at less than 20%, both their top and bottom lines. Uh, we budget the same, uh, the same at least 20% growth for this year. Uh, Banking sector is well capitalized. Uh, private banks are showing average returns on equity in excess of 30% and are growing their loan portfolios. To illustrate the growing business activity uh, around the country, I can give you a few figures uh, from uh, commercial real estate in which we have invested a lot and which we follow very closely. Um, the average vacancy in offices grew to over 25% in 2015, and since then it has dropped uh, to below 5%, which is level last seen in 2008, and this is despite uh, the office market uh, having added uh, over 1 million square meters of new, new space. As a result, rents are growing at 15% per annum, 40% of the new space is taken up by IT companies. Um, the same is the case also in logistics and uh, in the retail space, not only in Kiev, but across the country. The vacancies are close to zero, uh, which we last saw in 2007-2008. So business activity is picking up fast and will continue to do so if we have stable macro and no unexpected experiments in politics. Uh, on that note, I would like to pass the word to the President. Shanovni. Dear Prime Minister, dear Tomas, I am very grateful for the two very important things. First, the Dragon Capital is bringing investors together, and we can have an open and sincere conversation with you about uh, the existing situation about what was before, uh, what happens now, and what will come after. I want to thank you for another thing, one more thing. 
We're not just informing investors about the investment perspectives for the future. But Dragon Capital is investing in Ukraine. It believes in Ukraine. $500 million of investments is the vote for Ukraine's future. And this is the kind of investors that determine the investment future of our country. Five years ago, I participated in the annual conference of Dragon Capital as a member of parliament at that time. And over those five years, a whole uh, epoch has passed over those five years. Together with you, with our partners and colleagues from all over the world uh, who are investing in Ukraine, we are participating in uh, the um, amazing transition of Ukraine from the post-colonial country, a part of the so-called Russian world, to the state and society that is preparing to achieve the criteria that will allow Ukraine to apply for membership in the European Union and sign the plan of actions on the NATO membership. Our serious intentions are confirmed by the amendments to the Constitution that have been voted last week that provide, uh, that give power to the key law on our European and Euro-Atlantic integration. The Parliament has already supported this initiative of the President and next week I will sign the amendments to the Constitution. I hope this will happen publicly in Parliament. And this will be a very important stage and step in the history of our country. I took the public commitment to apply for EU membership in 2023 and get the um, accession membership plan. And you have broad uh, relations in the political and business circles, and I hope you can become lobbyists of Ukraine in this important endeavor and strategic process. First of all, every investor has their own financial interest in this, and our accession to those international organizations will improve the ratings of Ukraine. Secondly, you are people who are supporting European civilizational values, and none of you want Russia to come back here, and neither do you want Ukraine to uh, fall under the uh, yoke of Russia again. We managed to resist Russian aggression, not only thanks to the army. The, Ar the Kremlin has tried and continues trying to uh, 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 suffocate us with, uh, our, economically, using our former dependence on the Russian markets, and we will not let them do that anymore. The Kremlin has... Uh, provoked an economic crisis, but we have regained growth and we are moving to, we're transferring to uh, the uh, sustainable growth. And I want to thank you who have not lost, those of you who have not lost the faith in Ukraine in 2015, 16, 17, you were told from everywhere that default is inevitable, the rates uh, is uh, falling falling down fast and will reach 40 green as to dollar. The banking system is collapsing. You were told uh, the number of non-performing loans was 80 percent. Nothing and no one can uh, save this banking system. And it's not just the Russian aggression. Since 2008, we have had problems in the banking system and they were only growing. And over those years, over that time, you, like Tomas, have continued investing in Ukraine. And for your faith in our country and for your faith in the Ukrainian people, I want to thank you deeply. It is clear today that uh, we can, that it's, not, it's impossible not to invest in Ukraine. For 12 quarters, the economy has been growing sustainably. 3.4% GDP growth last year is the biggest growth uh, over the past seven years. The banking system is stable 
and is showing record revenues now. The Grivnia, with the saving of uh, the maintenance of uh, the currency reserves uh, and their growth, uh, the Grivnia is strengthening. The National Bank is very happy about this. This is a very a calm process, but the inflation targeting is ongoing. We have been talking about this for 20 years, but today we're demonstrating convincingly those processes. It is hard to downplay the role of the association agreement with the European Union. And Russian Federation has been trying to block this vehemently, the signing of this agreement, but it's working. Uh, and so is the FTA. And I'm happy with this figure. I'm proud of this figure. The share of the European Union in the structure of the Ukrainian expert is 42.6%. And the share of exports to Russian Federation is 7.7%. In 2018, we sold commodities to the EU for, well, more than any year of the economic relations between uh, Ukraine and the European Union. The volume of our trade with the European Union over the past uh, three years has grown by 55 percent. And this is an anchor. This is an anchor point uh, where no one can take this away for us over overnight, will not uh, announce embargo, will not use uh, the trade for foreign political pressure on my country. Um, as a result of the Russian aggression, as a result of the economic blockade, uh, Ukraine has lost a huge share of its GDP. In 2014, 2015, the governments of Arseniy Yatsenyuk, the government of uh, Vladimir Kroisman, had to take a lot of unpopular decisions. And I would like to emphasize that the president has never been hiding away from responsibility. We uh, were uh, collapsing our ratings knowingly uh, to make sure we can um, find the way to saving the country. Uh, the worst is behind. It is even hard to look back at it. And the improvement of investment climate, improvement of economy, strengthening of economy, and further development of investments are record high over the past years. No one and nothing can stop us. Remember, we uh, were dreaming about one-digit inflation single-digit inflation. And this was an unreachable dream in the times of war. But now we find it hard to imagine how can things be otherwise. The exchange rate already gives us the opportunity for mid-term and long-term investment forecasts. We are convinced that we have the biggest share of the international reserves. Our reserves are now higher than they were before the war. And I would like to emphasize this. We are confidently looking into the future. No one can stop us. However, besides Russian aggression, we also have another enemy. And that enemy is the poverty of the Ukrainian people. Today, when we're saying that there's one risk for investments and the risk is the number or the quality of the workforce, because the workforce now, including for reasons of uh, the visa-free regime, the workforce can travel freely and find jobs in the EU. Now, uh, there's only one solution to this, is to improve salaries, to increase salaries and to fight against poverty. Establishing highly qualified, highly productive jobs. And I'm very happy that investments that are coming to Ukraine are um, vividly demonstrating that. We will definitely 100% reach that goal. There was a divorce forum not so long ago. And uh, during that forum, 
The Ukrainian house has been functioning and it has become a good tradition. And it's not just the home for Ukrainians, but it's also home for investors. And during that forum in Davos, uh, a number of deals were signed, and I'd like to welcome Dragon Capital on that uh, $200 million in, for investments into small and medium businesses in Ukraine were collected. Documents were signed about investments on renewable energy for the amount of more than $450 million. The Sumar, Ch Sumar Chakrabarty has my big friend and the big friend of Ukraine has uh, named Ukraine a regional leader in the renewable energy sector. We have several key areas that are worth investing in. Strangely enough, the vast majority of them is in line with uh, the areas of investment of Dragon Capital. Good choice. That is the development of the agrarian sector, and not just because Ukraine has harvested a record high harvest last year. Ukraine has never, ever harvested 70 million tons of grain, ever. We have never had such quantities. And now that we are 10 top producers and uh, top three, uh, part of the top three biggest uh, sellers, Ukraine has become a major player. And my principal position is that, and I'm really convinced that we're going to do that, we're going to make it, is the processing industry. And the agrarian sector has to export products with high share of processing. And we have all preconditions necessary for that. Investments in IT sector. Ukraine already has 150,000 uh, IT professionals with extremely high salaries. Uh, they're building the core of the middle class. But I'd like to emphasize that this will grow. And a few years later, we expect this number to grow to um, 200,000. And for me, it is a matter of principle, and it will continue remaining the area of investment for the country. Wherever we have electricity and light, we will definitely have a broadband internet. And the development of IT sector will go beyond Kyiv and major cities. One of the areas is going to be the use and the utilization of favorable geographical position and Ukrainian logistics, the seaports, uh, the uh, in the broadening of bottlenecks and the railways, uh, establishing wonderful opportunities for transit. These investments will definitely pay off. The development of machine building and the new technologies and development of investor and, and engagement of investors into these sectors. Tourism development is very important. On average in the world, tourism builds for provides for 10% of GDP. We only have 0.5% now. And my task for the next five years to to bring uh, the number of tourists visiting Ukraine annually to 30 million people. And not only thanks to major cities with over 1 million population that have already become popular tourist destinations of the world. I don't want Ukraine to have any periphery. <laughs> and I hope that uh, international tourists and Ukrainian tourists, domestic tourists, learn how wonderful our country is. And our strategy um, sh tells us to set priorities, to emphasize the sectors in the economy where we can become leaders. They will become the breakthrough points. They will ensure this. They will bring the funding. They will um, improve the people's lives. They will build the foundation for improvement of well-being. And another important message, we will definitely continue our ascent in the doing business rating. Now we are number 71. And this is finally higher than some of the countries of the European Union. We already have several breakthrough draft laws that can ensure confident progress in 2019.
people are telling me that you have concerns about um, the um, electoral process and uh, just stopped by. And uh, Tomasz Fiola has not even uh, smiled when he was doing his introduction. We're grateful for that. And I'm not here as a candidate. I'm here as effective president. And uh, the start of the electoral campaign does not lift my responsibility for the current status of things. Elections not only give new opportunities for the country, they also give challenges. The first challenge is um, the throwback. Uh, risk is uh, interference of Russia in the electoral process. Part of the information, well, I'll try to publicize some of the information about Russia's interference during the Munich uh, Security Forum. Unfortunately, the, the process is ongoing and Russia is remaining very active. It's not about personal sympathies or controversy against someone. Uh, the um, antipathy of uh, Putin against the current, current Ukrainian president. They're trying to bring Ukraine back into the field of Russian influence. I'm openly talking uh, about this to you. But there's another challenge, the challenge of populism. We're not unique in this. And this, the whole world is infected with this malady. Maduro, Chavez are and many others are giving Ukraine a huge uh, variety of Venezuela political cuisine. The Ukrainian policy functioners and uh, have forgotten how their opportunity, how their attempts, attempts to bring down the sugar prices have uh, brought to deficit of sugar. Same thing happened to meat later on. Then for some time there was no petrol as soon as uh, directive uh, control of prices started from the government offices. Sugar crisis, meat crisis, petrol crisis are behind us in the history. But unfortunately, this has not taught the crisis makers anything. And they're trying to go back to government under the populistic uh, slogans. And my mission is not only to guarantee the unchangeable pro-European progress of Ukraine, but also to continue the Ukrainian economic policy that could help us uh, come to sustainable growth. And when the members of parliament come back after the electoral campaign, um, when they come back to the parliament, I will continue um, supporting the idea of uh, the tax on exported capital um, as a source of revenue. Also, we will raise re-raise the matter of land market, which is even bigger risk for Ukraine than the corruption. Uh, we will continue fighting against corruption. The matters of privatization has the matters of privatization of overexpanded sector of state sector of economy. Also, law enforcement uh, has to be removed from influencing business. I will use the first possible opportunity to make sure that the draft law and the establishment of the National Bureau of uh, Investigations uh, could be voted in Parliament in the nearest future. Dear ladies and gentlemen, populism is feeding on poverty and social injustice. So let me emphasize that unchangeable changes in Ukraine, sustainable changes in Ukraine can only be done through improvement of business, strengthening of business, and it starts with your investments. The sectoral priorities that I mentioned will um, give a powerful impetus to our economy. Billions of dollars of investments have been engaged for that purpose, and the purpose is to uh, build hundreds of thousands of uh, new small enterprises. Um, thousands and thousands of jobs that will improve the life of Ukrainians, bring back Ukrainians from overseas, bring them back home from overseas. This program will improve the uh, local budgets uh, that are actively developing decentralization efforts. This will improve uh, salaries to budget-funded uh, jobs. 
uh, will strengthen middle class and democracy and will make Ukraine even more attractive for investors. And I'm sure you will remember my words that Ukraine will successfully go through the turbulence zone, leave the turbulence zone behind. and. Two, pres two electoral campaigns, presidential and parliamentary, uh, will build the government, will build the power, the state that will uh, ensure sustainable positive changes, uh, will preserve Ukraine's progress towards the EU and NATO and the optimistic forecast. I'm very happy to hear Tomasz's optimism. Uh, who said in his welcoming speech that um, who provided um, just pure figures that can convince all of you that everything is going to be all right, that Ukrainians are responsible voters and clearly understand uh, their joint responsibility for the fate of the country. Ukraine and Ukrainians have paid a very high price uh, to have this chance to go forward, to progress, to continue reforms. It's going to be all right. We're going to win. Glory to Ukraine. It was very encouraging, and now I would like to invite uh, Prime Minister Groisman to address us as well. Uh, dear Mr. President, dear Thomas, Carl Bildt, fellow colleagues, ambassadors, I think that I just have to stand up here and say it. whatever the president said will come true. That's I support everything because, well, to be honest, there is a lot of responsibility laid um, upon our government. And we met with the president and I said it's very good that when the morning starts with the investment conference, it's extremely important when we have these platforms to discuss the development of the economy, investments, new opportunities, and the creators of those opportunities is the real sector, those who create, who invest, the new companies, new products. And this is something the state, our country, needs very much because over the last couple of years, uh, in the uneasy environment, we managed to escape the hands of the populists. Before 2014, we have been weak because every now and then weak, unprofessional decisions were made would, which would allow to provide uh, interim advantages, but then new crises would hit. And uh, this is the 15th conference. I think this is my third or fourth fourth time, right? And I remember us talking uh, to Thomas and here what the future will hold for us, what we were trying to do. And we had specific plans. And our plans were, first of all, about the economy to be restored and to grow. During uh, these couple of years, we can say that the economy began its growth, its renewal. We ensured macroeconomic stability. We, What we can see today is there is a prospect of economic growth in future. For us, the priority is uh, the growth of higher than 5%, and we need investment for that. For investments to come, we understand with, we need to have clear, clear rules and the guarantee uh, for these investments. The, that this is why the key position for us are structural reforms that we have been talking about with you uh, also here before. We started changing uh, the healthcare, education, pension system. We began implementing decentralization system which allows to develop regional economy and strengthen the competition between the regions and then brings about its own positive results already now. When we're meeting with regional governments, we're saying, well, <coughs> I brought this company, I brought another company in as an investment. They have instruments to motivate the companies to come and our task is to create quality climate for the investments, which means deregulation, smart regulation, that's part of our priority and the fact that from 136 point we lived up to 71 point that's a position that's the result of the decision of the government and we always made it together we talk to each other we want to find the best way out in order for you to have regulations that would uh, scale up your investments and feel more secure about your investments in terms of successes 
I have no doubt, and I think the same is true for you and your analysts, that Ukraine has a huge potential in terms of growth. And what different types of, of sectors of economy are showing in terms of the need for investment and the growth and, and good return investment is another manifestation of this. On the other hand, the structural reform has to change the quality of life in the country and ensure the facilitation of the development of uh, the economy in our country. In terms of uh, security, and, and just as I think our president mentioned about some of the threats, but we do need uh, a fair um, judicial system. I think 2019 is the year where such system will be strengthened by establishing um, an anti-corruption court. And I think today we have very good signals from the Supreme Court of Ukraine, a reformed Supreme Court, about the decisions that they're making. And uh, I think we are moving in the right direction, in fact. And uh, I agree with the statement that uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges is the quality of life of Ukrainian citizens. And here we are interested in the investments that come to Ukraine to create highly technological, well-paid jobs. And uh, what we are seeing today that the, the willingness of business to grow and to increase the number of jobs means that we have to move faster in terms of preparing and training the proper labor force for business. And this is why education one, is one of the key priorities in the work of, my, of our government. And I would like to say that, um, indeed, our government is pro-business pro-entrepreneurial. We do understand the challenges of the business. We are cooperating with business and we are in constant dialogue in order to make common decisions. On top of this, we are creating additional infrastructure that, that should allow business to be more successful, like Ukraine Invest Office that was established. Business associations and uh, the fund are cooperating with them, I'm sure. And uh, I think this is extremely important. So 2019 is both the year of opportunities and threats. In 2019, we walked with the new IMF program, new standby, uh, with a timely budget. It was approved on time and with high quality, well-balanced budget, realistic among others. We, this year, we are starting a mid-term uh, budgeting and we want to expand this horizon to be uh, more understandable uh, from the, uh, by outsiders to understand what we are going to do, not just in one year, but at least for three years ahead, and that's what we are switching to. We already started um, embarked on the reform of the fiscal service, revenue service, and uh, in 2019, I'm I'm sure we will do all it takes, and I have very good forecasts to support this because our Ministry of Finance, Sana Makarova, is dealing with this. Is that we will be able to buy, to build uh, a good service system, revenue system, and uh, taxation uh, service for Ukraine from the 1st of January. The system of supervision in the area of regulation was changed. Before 2019, the system was a Soviet system, to be honest. Before 2019, now we have borrowed the new European system, which is risk-oriented and not which was uh, the business you, when you can't, when people were common by formal characteristics, they were trying to create some obstacles for, for business. We have an ambitious plan both by the decision of the of the parliament and the cabinet of ministers to make a significant progress in uh, uh, doing business uh, rent, uh, rating that's one of our key priorities in terms of 2019 risks well that's an election campaign of course which uh, brings along the risks of populism and i have seen and i do see these uh, recipes that we hear from many uh, mainstream media, these um, these very simple, allegedly simple solutions for very complicated problems. I haven't seen any examples in the contemporary Europe where such instruments would have worked. The only difference between Ukraine and other countries that uh, today 
uh, um, are in the European Union is that they have this resilience against populism. For decades, they have been a strong, a st a thriving economy in many countries. They've created their resilience uh, cushion, and these countries can can choose either they will invest in the strengthening of their own country and their development or people will bring populists to power who will start spending whatever was accumulated uh, over these past years so uh, the crisis is inevitable but it will become later ukraine doesn't have that choice because any step in a populistic direction will cost extremely much to uh, to Ukrainian people, and that's uh, you can't allow this. I like very this sober uh, perspective of business on government and statesmen. You have clear demands, uncompromised in the decisions that have to be made for uh, rehabilitation of economy, for creation of the normal business climate. And as a prime minister, I would like to say that, and the president also stated this. Uh, we are totally on the same page with you in terms of the need to change the situation, opening up Ukraine, for Ukraine to be stronger and for people to become the main beneficiaries of the positive changes that inevitably will come to Ukraine. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you, first of all, for your work, for investing in Ukraine, for having trust in Ukraine, to be for your optimism for 2019. It's not so much the government that changed the country, but the investments. That's a totally new culture of doing business, new um, requi labor requirements. Uh, this means uh, n new aspects of social responsibility, and this is what makes a difference in the country. This is what brings all of us uh, together. And I call upon you to keep on investing. I'm deeply convinced that these investments will be successful and protected. And recently I presented the ECC and I said that I don't want to forecast uh, for this presidential campaign. We live in the democratic uh, country and only Ukrainians themselves will decide who will um, uh, work on that position and develop the country, but I'm deeply convinced that common sense shall win, That uh, and this will allow us to be strong, healthy European country that uh, will inevitably move towards European integration and towards um, the family of uh, North Atlantic Treaty. Thank you for believing in Ukraine. Let's work together. Let's make Ukraine stronger and your business more successful. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, former Prime Minister of uh, Sweden and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, Carl Bildt, uh, to give us uh, an, uh, a view of Ukraine from the outside. It's also interesting to say that uh, while uh, Mr. Bildt was Prime Minister of Sweden in the early 90s, he negotiated uh, the agreement to join the European Union, and uh, it is also in the interests of and that, was, and that was a long time ago. Yes. Um, and, 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 and a lot of things have happened since then, and I will try to be brief on some, some remarks on where we are. Thanks for inviting me. This is um, undoubtedly a, an interesting and challenging year, uh, obviously for Ukraine, but uh, for Europe. And the combination is, of course, of particular importance. If we look back, and I think that's always important, it has been, um, for Ukraine, a modern history of uh, profound drama. Ukraine came out of the Soviet Union with fairly significant assets. A human talent that was impressive, technological competence in the middle of the ruins of the Soviet Union that was also fairly impressive, and assets in the form of agricultural lands and other things that should not be neglected. But what Ukraine did not have was also critical. No real experience of independent governance, no experience of the rule of the law, no experience of an open and functioning economy. And while other transition economies did more or less well in the decades that followed, it has to be said in all honesty that Ukraine did very badly. 
it turned into one of the worst governed places of Europe. Not perhaps the worst, but one of the worst governed places of Europe to the detriment of the future possibilities of the country. Ten years ago, the European Union launched what was called the Eastern Partnership Initiative. And the reason for that was that by that time, the European Union had been enlarged to include the neighbors of Ukraine to the west. They had become full members of the European Union. And the European Union also at the time had a rather elaborate and intense relationship with the big neighbor to the east, with Russia, but didn't have very much of policies towards the important countries in between, Ukraine being the most important of them. But that was then put in place. And eventually also the very far-reaching and very ambitious, uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement was negotiated. The rest is history. Mr. Putin came back as president for his third time to Russia and decided that his main thing was to develop what he called a Eurasian economic and subsequently Eurasian Union. And he's not a stupid man. He understood that without Ukraine, this at the end of the day would amount to very little. And what we then saw from the summer of 2013 up until, I would say, August, September of 2014, was um, economic, financial, political, and eventually military aggression against Ukraine in order to force Ukraine away from the cause that Ukraine itself had decided and force it into the fold that Mr. Putin had designed for it. That eventually failed. Ukraine survived. But we should remember that it wasn't entirely obvious that that was going to be the case. Because it was a combination of both the aggression in different forms and the massive incompetence of the previous governance of this place that uh, threatened the financial and the political very survival of the country during that particular critical year. So why did Ukraine survive? Well, there was an element, has to be said, of international support by the European Union, by the United States, by the international financial institution. But primarily, Ukraine survived because in spite of the ex expectations that Ukraine would fracture, instead Ukraine came, came together in first the presidential and then the parliamentary election. That was what was critical. And then Ukraine itself, with international support, started to do what should have been done a long time ago. The years since then have been not been uh, entirely smooth. That is often the case, always the case. But I think the achievements are significant. The famous agreement with the European Union is there and is starting to transform the economy and the economic prospects. And there has been very significant structural reforms. We tend to forget that sometimes. The macroeconomic situation, which was fairly disastrous, or utterly disastrous, five years ago with the double deficits is now virtually okay, if I'm allowed to say that. You should never say that, but could have been significantly worse. The banking sector, the gas sector, the decentralization, the health sector. There was a period, I would even add, when there were more structural, significant structural reforms undertaken in Ukraine than in the rest of Europe taken together. By necessity, you might say, because it was long delayed, but it was done. And that is why Ukraine is where Ukraine is today. Then we all know that this is just the beginning. Uh, the latest assessment of the IMF points a picture of everything that has happened. That is good. But also paints a picture of everything that remains to be done, which is quite significant. No country has been transforming itself completely in just five years. So the agenda ahead is tough. Election years are always rather special. Uh, populism has been alluded to. And it has to be said in all honesty that no vibrant democracy is entirely free from the bug of populism during an election year. It happens to us all to some extent. But it is a dangerous thing. Because there's a tendency to overpromise during election campaign by everyone. 
but that leads to underperformance after election, and that is dangerous for the economic credibility of the country, and I would argue even more dangerous long term for the political stability, for democratic confidence of the country. Because if people see that politicians promise but don't deliver, they lose faith both first in the politicians and then possibly in the system itself. And then there might be others prepared to help. I saw that our dear and beloved friend Mr. Sukhov has written a piece in Moscow yesterday where he offered uh, some advice on uh, help that can be given on how to govern countries that lose faith in democracy. I think that should be avoided. So it is a challenging year for you and for the European Union. With um, the elections to the European Parliament, appointments to the, all the positions that are going to be happen after that, and a very different world for Europe. A revision is Russia. Well, you've seen that, but not everyone had seen that before. An assertive China that's looming larger and larger on the agendas, and a disruptive United States, which is perhaps, perhaps the most difficult of the challenges, because the transatlantic relationship, be that trade, be that security, is the by far deepest relationship that we find anywhere in the world. And when this relationship is not in particularly good shape, for reasons I don't need to go into, then that is a challenge. Add to that, the world economy is not going to be quite as good as we had hoped it to be. Add to that, the tragedy of Brexit is primarily for the Brits, but for everyone else as well. And the migration challenge, the digital transition challenge, the security challenge, it's a fairly full agenda for the European Union. So your question might well be, so what about the neighborhood? What about Ukraine? Will we disappear from the agenda of the European Union? And I would say, no. The neighborhood will always be fundamental. The southern neighborhood is not in a particularly good shape, to put it very mildly. We have commitment to the Western Balkans, which is a somewhat complicated region. And then we have the entire East, which remains fundamental. The European Union continues to seek. I'm now sort of going into the agenda of the ambassador here, but I think he tolerates me mildly. Um, the European Union continues to seek a good relationship with, our, with Russia. That's necessary for the future. But the ball is in their court. If we, as long as we have a situation where they don't respect international law, where they don't respect territorial integrity, where they don't respect the sovereignty and the right of every nation to choose its own destiny, the problem will be there. The ball is in their court. A Donbass settlement is imperative. The Crimea issue will remain. Where Russia is heading is anyone's guess. The country has entered a period of internal stagnation in combination with externally seeking a more powerful role on the global stage, and this all comes together in the Donbass conflict. I don't know how they will get themselves out of that, and I think I know that they don't know how they will get themselves out of that. I think they will wait and see. And very important will be what happens here, the determination of Ukraine to continue its course, and the determination of the European Union and the West to continue its course. I don't think that you need to be afraid of any Ukraine fatigue under one condition. There will not be a Ukraine fatigue in Europe as long as there is no reform fatigue in Ukraine. Were there to be reform fatigue in Ukraine, there will be Ukraine fatigue in Europe. The ball, also in this respect, is in your court. So, my message is essentially challenging for Europe with a agenda that is difficult, challenging for you. A start has been made, but the agenda ahead is a tough one. But the door is open to further integration of Europe and integration of Ukraine into Europe. Thank you. I would like to now thank uh, the president and the prime minister. Uh, they will unfortunately uh, have to 
work, and we will stay with Carl here. <laughs>